Welcome to the New Books Network. Uh, hello, my name is Troy Hossel, and I'm your host on New Books in the American West, the channel of the New Books Network. Today I'm speaking with Amanda Van Lannen. She's a professor of history at Lewis Clark State College in Lewiston, Idaho, and we're discussing her new book, The Washington Apple, Orchards and the Development of Industrial Agriculture, published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2022. In the 19th century, most American farms had a small orchard or at least a few fruit-bearing trees. People grew their own apple trees or purchased apples grown within a few hundred miles of their homes. Nowadays, in contrast, Americans buy mass-produced fruit in supermarkets, and roughly 70% of apples come from Washington State. So how did Washington become the leading producer of America's most popular fruit? And this lightning book, Amanda Van Lannen, um, offers a comprehensive response to this question by tracing the origins, evolution, and environmental consequences of the state's apple industry. Washington's success in producing apples is not a happy accident of nature. Um, Apples are not native to Washington any more than potatoes are to Idaho or peaches to Georgia. In fact, Washington farmers were late to the game, lagging their eastern competitors. Uh, Ben Layden outlines the numerous challenges early Washington entrepreneurs faced in such areas as irrigation, transportation, and labor. Eventually, with the crucial help from railroads, Washington farmers transformed themselves into growers by embracing uh, new uh, technologies and marketing strategies. By the 1920s, the state's growers managed not not only to innovate the industry, but to dominate it. Industrial agriculture has its fair share of problems involving the environment, consumers, and growers themselves. In the quest to create the perfect apple, early a- or excuse me, early growers did not question the long-term environmental effects of chemical sprays. Since the late uh, 20th century, consumers have increasingly questioned the environmental safety of industrial apple production. Today, as this book reveals, the apple industry continues to evolve in response to shifting consumer demands and accelerating climate change. Yet though, yet through it all, the Washington apple maintains its iconic status as Washington's most valuable agricultural crop. Amanda, thanks for speaking with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Troy. Um, so I always like to start off with this one. How did you come to write this book? So I grew up in Saipan, which is a little island out in the Pacific near Guam, and We had apples in our local grocery store. They were red delicious and they were terrible. I don't know if you've had this experience, Troy, but you bite into an apple and it looks beautiful and perfect and shiny and red and you just get a mouthful of mush. And that's how these were. And so it was a revelation when I moved to the Pacific Northwest and actually had a proper apple fresh from the orchard. It was crunchy. It was juicy. It was full of flavor. So different from that grocery store apple I grew up with. Uh, But at the same time, the fact that I live in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on this little bitty island and we had apples year round was also kind of an amazing thing. So those incongruities were what kind of led me to look into this topic more. Okay. I I find a lot of folks when they, especially with their their first book project, there's usually a personal connection (laughs) trying to answer what's up with this, you know, in in your own personal lives, you know. Uh, So so thanks for that. It's uh, interesting to see how you came across this topic. Um. So what did the, the research process look like for this book? Um, you know, what kind of sources did you use? Uh, was there one or type one that you found most beneficial? Essentially, kind of, what was the, well, what did you use to create this story? So this is actually now growth in my dissertation. And I w- did my graduate work at Washington State University. And so um, Washington State University, originally Washington State College, was very involved in the research that helped promote the apple industry. So I was very lucky that most of the scientific reports and grower journals and all of that industry information was housed at my university library. Um, But the big thing that I really relied on were railroad records, the records from the Great Northern and Northern Pacific Railway companies, which are housed at the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, What I think a lot of people don't realize is how involved the railroads were in, in promoting industry in the West. They had their fingers in everything you can imagine economically going on out west and the fabulous thing about working with the railroad records is that they're fairly complete um there's over twenty thousand cubic feet in those collections so it's, it's very massive it's everything it's not just it's not just apples um but the railroads kept carbon copies of the letters they sent out and then the copies of the letters they received and so um i think sometimes it's kind of rare where we do historical research to get both sides of a correspondence to really get that full picture of what was the conversations that were happening. 
And then that's all. It's nice that they had, you know, the outgoing and the incoming. So you kind of, you knew exactly what they were responding to. I, you know, I'm sure you came across this too in your own research often is that you get the response, but you don't have the letter that prompted it. And so you're left kind of wondering, well, I have an idea of what they were, you know, what was in that previous one, but it's all guesswork. Oh, all the time, all the time. I mean, I ran across a little bit, but it is much nicer when you have both sides of the, the correspondence. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so we'll just jump right into it and let's kind of work through the book itself. Um, we'll just kind of, we'll start from the beginning. So how did the apple come to Washington state? Well, the story that gets told is a very romantic story. A young officer who worked for Hudson's Bay company was preparing to go to the Oregon territory and a farewell dinner was given in his honor. And while he was at the dinner, the young lady sitting next to him saved her apple pips from the dinner and wrapped them in her handkerchief and gave them to the officer to remember her by. And when he arrived at Fort Vancouver, he realized he had these apple pips in his pocket and they planted them, thus giving rise to the very first tree, the oldest apple tree in the Pacific Northwest, um, which tragically died in the summer of 2020. <laughs> now, that's a really romantic story. It's very sweet. It's oft repeated. I'm not sure that that's actually what happened. <laughs> Um, the Hudson Bay Company was having trouble feeding their employees in the Pacific Northwest. Their employees didn't like the local foods that were available, and the company was spending a lot of money shipping flour and other foodstuffs to Oregon. And so in 1825, under Chief Factor John McLaughlin, they started gardens at Fort Vancouver. And we know that McLaughlin requested seeds from the London Horticultural Society, we know that a member of the London Horticultural Society visited Fort Vancouver in 1825. And so there's a good probability that the seeds more likely came from that type of source rather than this kind of romantic telling. Um, in any case, that that was uh, Fort Vancouver is is where the first first apple tree in the Pacific Northwest came from. No, yeah. And it's, you know, I, I kind of you said that the, the folks that were living and working there didn't care for the food in the area. And it, it, it got in my head, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, beggars can't be choosers at that t point in time, but I guess you can't, you know what I mean? Well, actually, there was one year when uh, Hudson's Bay Company employees butchered 700 horses for meat. And yeah, and the company's, you know, this is not sustainable. This is incredibly expensive. This is ridiculous. Um, you know, salmon's one of the primary primary foods for tribes in the Columbia Plateau. And and yeah, the employees just didn't didn't care for salmon, which I think is pretty crazy because it's delicious but were there were there any like cultural issues behind that or was it just for them kind of a a, a very different type of food it, it's been a sub maybe i'm not that. sure i'm not sure i've not run across anything um i didn't delve that too deeply uh, why that was the case but um hudson bay company had established uh previous agricultural experiments in the red river valley and and so they had tried this before as a way to cut costs. So the idea of starting a farm wasn't exactly new for the, for okay. the company. Well, I mean, to kind of build off of the, the the starting farm so they can, you know, at least produce some of their food, um, was was the apple like front of mind when they were doing that? Or was that just kind of one of many things that they tried to, to, to try to produce some sort of food source for the for the, the folks working, living and working out there? For the Hudson Bay Company, it was one of many things. Uh, they primarily um, grew things like timothy, alfalfa, wheat, um, things that could be animal fodder or things that could feed their employees. Um, they had orchards with a variety of fruits, grapevines, vegetables. They tried a lot of things. So for the company specifically, it was more um, about feeding feeding their employees. But for Americans, as Americans were moving west, apple trees did have a very large significance, not just as a food source, but as a symbol of taming the frontier. So for example, in the old Northwest Territory, in order to prove a land claim, you had to plant 50 apple or pear trees to prove that claim. And so as settlers start coming on the Oregon Trail, apples carry that additional significance of kind of demonstrating civilization in a sense. Uh, and so for me, that actually does sound like a, a bit of a familiar story. I, I think I'm more familiar with it. Um, and it's not an either or. It's probably a both thing. Thinking in terms of like the, the elm tree, you know, the tree of New England that as the, the U.S.'s borders moved west, folks would bring with them, you know, 
the plants that reminded them or like you said signified hey this is this you know in a sense this is now ours you know and and um and it would take root and and, and things of that nature um so so kind of and it, maybe this is the the springboard to the next question here right so so you have apples apple trees you know the the fruit bearing trees you know making their way out to to washington state and and, and up there in, in that uh, northwest region and you know like you said, it was one of many things, right, that came out during that time period. But, you know, the book you wrote is called the Washington, you know, Washington Apples, you know. So so kind of expand on that, like what um, in this case, you know, what roles did like the railroads and then irrigation and stuff in, in play in kind of creating this environment, whether like it's the actual environment or maybe more kind of a mindset or the economic part that made it possible to, to, to start a burgeoning apple industry there in Washington. So just to kind of lead off into this, apples were grown everywhere. Um, it wasn't just Washington in the early years. They were tried in many places in the West, in many irrigated districts in the West. Um, and every county in Washington state at the turn of the century had some commercial apple production. So this started out as something fairly widespread. Um, where we get the convergence of irrigation and railroads, um, railroads become involved in a variety of economic activities because they need something to haul on their lines. They need that revenue coming from things that they're shipping. And so this is where we see the railroads either directly, but often through uh, subsidiary corporations becoming invested in timber and wheat and apples and and anything you can you can think of across the west and so as the railroad companies are kind of looking at the lands along their lines they're trying to figure out how to maximize their profits and how to make these areas as economically viable as possible so they're thinking in terms of what's going to be the most profitable industry for a particular area so central washington is very dry and this is something I have to explain to many people who've never been out to Washington. Um, even my publishers tried to shoehorn the Evergreen State into my title. <laughs> like, that's the west side of the state where they get rain. East of the Cascades, it's very dry. And the areas that ultimately become the primary growing regions in the state get less than 10 inches of rain a year. So as folks are looking at these areas, um, there had been some early mining rushes in the 1860s and 70s. And miners that remained behind had turned those mining diversion canals into irrigation canals and had shown that the soil was actually really quite fertile. It's, it's rich volcanic soil. It's just dry. And so the idea was, well, we can irrigate these areas. And this is also at a time when, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner is saying the frontier is closed. There's no more opportunities out West. And so what are our options? And there's a group of people kind of nationally as part of this conversation saying, well, if we irrigate the West, that's going to open more land. That's going to kind of help solve this problem that Turner has outlined. So that is really part of the impetus for this and trying to irrigate these areas. Now, a good deal of irrigated land in the West was put into alfalfa and cover crops. Those aren't particularly profitable. If you're going to irrigate, you need to grow something that can, that can turn a profit. And so from very early on, uh, both the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern Railroad were encouraging people who purchased these tracts of land to grow apples. Because the idea is this is a, a higher value crop. Apples can be stored better than other fruits. And this is something that can potentially be profitable. Um, in fact, the, the promoters in Wenatchee said dollars grow on trees. This is a place where dollars grow on trees. Right? <laughs> I, I show up. Um, sit back and wait for the money money to roll in. Of course, the railroads have an alternative motive as well. They're not just trying to create traffic to haul. Um, the Northern Pacific had land grants that it needed to sell, and bare desert land was practically valueless. Um, the Great Northern did not get land grants, but it did have a, a real estate department, and it was involved in several real estate uh, companies along its lines. And so both of these companies also had the kind of added incentive that they wanted to sell these lands and make a profit. So very reluctantly, both companies ended up investing in irrigation so that they could 
settle and sell the lands that they had. You know, often in large, it's, it's just something I've never studied railroads to into any kind of real, you know, uh, depth. But as, as you were talking about railroads and their multifaceted role kind of going out west, you know, I had the light bulb go off in my head. And at the same time, I felt like an idiot because I'm going, well, yeah, they're not building railroads for the sake of doing it. You know, you know, you know, going west, you know, they can move people in building supplies to help build these towns for those that have land grants or the real estate departments and stuff like that. But like in my back of my head, I'm going, well, why on earth did I not even realize they also want to ship stuff back east, you know? And, and it was just something that I, I, I don't know, took for granted or was, you know, ignorantly unaware of as far as just the fact that it's the, the shipping companies. I mean, that's literally what they do. And, and almost to an extent that like I was more familiar with the real estate side of, of railroad companies and, and that part of their business than I was the shipping, which is why they kind of existed to begin with. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's just kind of me. You're professing my ignorance on, on a topic there. Well, and they they try to. I mean, this is also getting into an era where we're talking about trust busting and concerns about monopolies. So they were trying to be very strategic in how they, as in public face of what they were doing. So, for example, things like the Wenatchee Development Company, which um, the Great Northern was invested in. It wasn't a Great Northern subsidiary, but if you look at the board of directors of that company, like half of them are Great Northern officials. So you see the fingerprints of the railroad in different ways. Sometimes it was a subsidiary corporation or a subsidiary of a subsidiary uh, where they would try to put some distance between themselves and these other economic activities. Or sometimes if it was a case of of railroad officials sitting on the boards of separate companies. So they're technically separate, but when half of your board of directors is made up of railroad officials, there's there's a strong connection there. Yeah, I think it definitely feel, has a feel of a very incestuous type relationship almost. Um, very much so. Yeah, which, whether then or now, maybe maybe that's it's definitely doesn't seem to be an uncommon, um, uncommon type thing. Um, so kind of the second part of the question... Um, to have a chapter here. So, so you have railroads building towns, uh, investing in the real estate side, uh, trying to get, um, you know, irrigation going to turn this, you know, into productive farmland. So you do have folks coming out there. Um, and I, I would imagine they see, you know, they, they see the advertisement in Chicago and go, Hey, I'm moving out to, to Washington state. Right. And then they get there and they go, this doesn't look like what I see. You know, they're looking at the, the, the advertisement stuff. So, what was life like for these early settlers out here in this apple producing regions? Um, was it one of those situations, you know, they, they just showed up and everything ran just like clockwork or, or was it more of a challenge? Definitely a challenge. Yeah, definitely a challenge. And I mean, this is a common thread we see in promotional literature in a lot of places in the West. I know you're in Montana. Um, similar things for railroad promotional literature in Montana where the brochures are glossy. They have these wonderful pictures. They tell you about all the amenities of the town and all of the economic opportunities and how much money you're going to make. But the reality is you show up, it's not quite like that. Um, some people showed up and found that the irrigation systems were not quite completed. And so they didn't actually have water yet. Um, people showed up and, you know, not, not quite realizing how much of a desert it was. And, and not realizing how much work it was going to be. So part of the problem is the people that they're attracting to these orchards, they, they were really targeting kind of middle-class white individuals. Many of the people who moved to central Washington to start orchards had no farming experience. And even if they did have farming experience, irrigation is a whole new ballgame. So really people had no idea what they were doing. And then you couple that with the fact that even if you do plant your orchard, you're not going to have a bearing fruit tree for about five years. So in the meantime, how do you support yourself when you've sunk all of your money into this plot of desert that that you're trying to make a living on? So the pre, I, I was never able to pin down exactly what the failure rate was, but there were quite a number of people who who moved on. Now, and that was a thing I, I, I didn't realize is like how long it did take for um, an apple tree to produce fruit. And so if you're really, like you said, if you're moving out there to, to create an orchard, 
you know, to, you know, like, you're right. How, how are you going to support yourself for five to seven years until that thing starts to, to actually produce a, a crop that you can turn around and sell? Um, I, I could easily see, like I said, you weren't sure about the failure rate. I, I, I suspect it was probably pretty high unless you're moving from New York State and you already had apples. You know what I mean? Um, and the, the West really is bringing some knowledge with you. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that was... And there's a lot... A lot of concern about absentee ownership, but I mean, the reality was people had to make a living. And so there were a lot of people who um, would tend to their farms as best they could, but they had their job in town that they had to maintain. Otherwise, they couldn't support themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you do have folks that get out there and, and obviously somebody's able to get a work going. Um, so can you can you talk about just that process? Not that it's like, you know, you start here, you end here, but just overall, like, how did uh, these growers manage their orchards? And, and, and really, I'm just kind of asking you, you know, from year to year, what did their job look like when they were trying to produce crop for profit? So most of these orchards were fairly small, around 20 acres or so. And the idea that these would be manageable farms that, that a family could perform most of the labor on themselves with the exception of some additional help at harvest. So once your orchard was established, you'd start kind of in the in the late winter, early spring, monitoring your trees, making sure you weren't going to get a freeze if you needed to put out smudge pots or orchard heaters or something to make sure in case there was a last freeze. Um, that would be followed by a cycle of, of pruning in the early spring. And then you'd have a series of um, sprays. So one of the big problems with orchards is coddling moth. And so you would have to spray pesticides to, to take care of that in your orchard. And in fact, that was actually required by the State Board of Horticulture. You had to spray your orchard, otherwise you would, you would be fined because the threat of those pest infestations could affect your neighbors and everyone around you. Um, and then the big work would come in the fall at harvest time. And so in early years... Um, folks would harvest and then they would pack the fruit right there on the orchard. And so there's pictures of these little, these little sheds that people have set up in the orchard where they're packing the, picking the fruit and packing it immediately. Um, in later years, most of the fruit would have been taken to a cooperative where it would have been collectively packed by hired professionals. Um, and then that's, that's, that's kind of your year. That's kind of what your year would look like in terms of, of labor. Okay. Well, you know, one thing I actually did talking about packing, that was actually part of the part of the story I found most interesting is that, you know, there appeared to be kind of a an art slash science to storing these apples, whether it was, you know, and I forget I forget the term for it, but you know, you had boxes out west and you had barrels out back east. But in each instance, right, there was a certain way to do it to ensure that those were, were decent crops for storage and then later on. So could could you kind of talk about that the whole packing thing you know i i don't know um you know just you know because like i said they, they could store for so long right and you, you need enough so i don't know could you just kind of talk about the packing process well, part of this is because there's the added cost of, of transportation and the cost of growing the apple so washington apples cost three times as much as an apple produced in new york and so from the get-go growers had to figure out how, how to add value to a fresh piece of fruit and so the way they did that was to create the most perfect apple they could possibly create. So um, this is at a time before Eastern growers are really using pesticides. Uh, their Washington growers are spraying their apples so you don't have wormholes. Um, and then they're wrapping them individually and packing them in boxes. So um, back east, barrels were used. A, a roughly equivalent three boxes per barrel, kind of how, how the equivalencies work out. Um, growers were told to just jam the apples in the barrel and make them so tight the apples didn't rattle around. And it was expected that the top and bottom layers of the barrels would just kind of get smushed and mushy and juicy and seep in. And that was, that was fine. Whereas Washington growers wanted to make sure everything was pristine. Now, part of the reason they adopted boxes was because there weren't the hardwoods out here that there are back east that are needed for barrel production. Um, but boxes are also easier to load onto a rail car. And so um, they had packing schools in the early years to teach people how to pack. Apples would be sized 
so that the sizes refer to how many apples fit in an apple box. So the higher the number, the smaller the apple. And, and um, you know, they would, they would hire people who would come back and do this job year after year because it, it paid fairly well um, to size and clean and wrap and pack the apples. Sure. Yeah, no, that was just probably one of my most interesting parts of the of the the story on the whole process there. Um, so you talk about you know that the helps get them to you know the boxes like I said easier to, to operate to load up a, a train car. Um, what challenges did growers face in getting their fruit to market, and then how do they try to address those challenges? So many challenges. Um, the biggest one being a distance from markets. Um, you know the primary markets are two, 3,000 miles away. And so you're putting your apples on this rail car and, and you're just kind of blind. Uh, you have to trust the people on down the line who are facilitating the sale of these apples and trust that they're not um, cheating you. And that that was very difficult. Um, growers partly solved that, that problem by forming cooperatives. Now, this was a really challenging thing because growers had been sold on these orchards by the fact that they would be independent business people, you know, that you're you're going to you're going to own your own business. You're going to be your own boss. And so the idea of joining a cooperative was kind of the antithesis of of the individualism that had been kind of baked into the sales pitch. But at the same time, there's no way one single person can be an expert in every step of the process when we're trying to market something at a distant location. So cooperatives became part of the solution where you could join the cooperative. Um, some of these cooperatives also including packing and storage and, and shipping and took care of that. Some of them were more more simply marketing cooperatives um, where, where there were people who could coordinate sales and coordinate where things were being shipped and keep an eye on market demand and prices, um, and advertise. So, um, this is also a time in the United States when we're seeing the kind of beginnings of, of branded characters. And so, for example, the, the, uh, Skookum Indian becomes one of the early branded characters uh, the Northwest Fruit Exchange introduces that character in 1916. It's a it's a cartoon Indian that is used to advertise Washington apples, magazine ads, uh, billboards, promotional cookbooks, all the kind of marketing things that that other companies are doing. Cooperatives are also doing to try to try to raise awareness and get people to buy more Washington apples. So so the cooperatives, like you said, um you know, no one farmer is an expert of the entire from production to sale, right? And so cooperatives allowed them. It sounds like the kind of a bunch of farmers and stuff and growers can come in and um, kind of uh, come together and let different people do different parts of that job. But, you know, for me, I'll sit there thinking, and so kind of tell me if I'm, I'm on the right track here. Did this allow them to kind of do stuff, at, you know, in a sense at scale um, in a way to kind of save money? You know, and here I actually am thinking about the packing and the shipping, right? Because, you know, if 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 one co-op or one company can buy all the materials at a much higher volume, you know, then all of a sudden the box per box becomes cheaper, right? Then that actually ends up being more money in the pocket of the farmer. But also, I'm also thinking too of that, like, you know, one farmer may, may not be able to fill up an entire rail car, but maybe three through a cooperative could. And so, so am I am I kind of on the right track here that you know that it actually allowed them to do a lot more, even though they had to give up a little bit of that independence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there were some cooperatives that simply were buying cooperatives. They didn't do any marketing. They just help help growers pool their resources to get a better price on on supplies. Um, so these cooperatives took a lot of different forms, but that did help scale things up um, in a lot of different ways. And I guess, too, for the marketing cooperative, how, how did that fit into to that? You know, because I consider thinking that, that marketing isn't necessarily... Um, I don't know, at scale, you know what I mean? It's not the same as buying enough stuff for boxes, but the, clearly a lot of farmers got on board with the marketing side of it to kind of sell the products. Can you kind of talk about how that, other than the fact of the marketing, how did that actually help the farmers in the long run there? Well, the the folks who were proponents of cooperatives would argue that this would help better prices because rather than flooding the market all at once with everyone's apples, you could kind of selectively 
target when prices were a little bit higher and keep some of those apples back in storage so that you could keep demand and prices a little bit higher throughout the season so that everyone would get a better price and everyone would would do better that way. Um, you know, one of the ways um, the Northwest Fruit Exchange, one of the ways that they kind of kind of split the difference with this issue of independence versus being a member of the cooperative is on the Apple box labels. They allowed growers to put their own individual emblem. So the, the grower's emblem was kind of in the middle of the label. And then they had a big border around with the Skookum Indian and the Northwest Fruit Exchange logo. So that at least let growers feel like their own stamp was still somehow on those apples. Okay. So, so they weren't kind of subsumed underneath the umbrella of the co-op. Like those and not, not always entirely. No. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. And I guess, I guess one thing I, I, I kind of didn't realize, so the marketing I had in my head, it was just the advertising, but if they're watching the market, so I, I they're looking at, well, wh where's price is high, where price is low. They could say, well, Hey, Minneapolis is flush with, with apples, but Dallas doesn't have any. So if we send them down that way, you know, we're, we're going to get a better price. So, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay, cool. And there was actually some debate about this because, you know, that type of market research was, was critically important. And there were some folks who said, that's what we need to focus on. Uh, why are we wasting money on magazine advertisements in the Saturday Evening Post? Um, but then there were other people who said, well, we need to, we need to also reach out to consumers. So there was some debate over, over how much to focus kind of on the, the distribution side versus the consumer side of the marketing. And I guess how fierce, if it was fierce at all, was the competition between, you know, the East Coast Apple producers and the Washington folks? Not much at first. I mean, I think the New York growers kind of didn't pay much attention to Western apples until the late teens and early 20s, at which point they kind of realized, oh, no, these apples really are um, giving us a run for our money. And this is a serious competitor. And I mean, the thing was, New York's orchards were very well established. Uh, a lot of the trees were aging. They were still profitable, but, um, you know, Eastern growers were a little slower to adopt the the cutting edge scientific methods that Western growers were using because economically it didn't pencil out for them in the same way. And so by the 1920s, they're trying to play catch up to these Western apples that that they do see by that point as as competition. Okay, okay. Well, the next question, I think you've already kind of gotten into it, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, you know, so, you know, wh why did the growers need to market their crops? Um, then I guess also to how did they do it? Maybe that's the question to ask is not the why, but the how. You know, what, what are the marketing? So I know you talked about branding and stuff like that, but um, is there anything you can, help, you can add to or to elaborate or expand on when it came to the how of marketing? Um, well, I think one of one of the big also challenges was was not just the distance from markets, but the logistics of transportation. Because apples had to be transported in refrigerated rail cars. Those were specialized pieces of equipment. And the railroads only had a finite number of refrigerated rail cars. So just to give you a sense of kind of how this worked in the early days, um, in, 15, in 1915, the Great Northern, as, as a whole railroad system, only owned 3,600 refrigerated rail cars. That year, Wenatchee was estimated to ship nine to 10,000 boxes of apples, or carloads of apples, rather. So three times as many carloads of apples as the number of cars available. And the turnaround time on these cars was about 70 days on average, so really quite slow. The problem, the problem wasn't getting them to the East Coast. The problem was getting the car back west so that it could be could be reloaded you know, with the interchanges with with various railroads along the way. So that was a challenge. Now, the railroads said we need more storage. The problem is there wasn't a lot of cold storage in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in 1915, that same year, there was enough cold storage in the entire Pacific Northwest for about a million boxes of apples. That's every single cold storage warehouse in the region. But there were seven million apples, seven million boxes of apples produced that year. So there's there's no way. Um, and most of the cold storage facilities are back east. So that that kind of lag in the in the infrastructure was something that that was very challenging. Uh, growers thought that the railroads should take responsibility for building storage. The railroad said, no, that's the growers responsibility. <laughs> I kind of went back and forth on that. Um, 
in most instances, growers did have to did have to fit the bill. Um, and again, this is a place where cooperatives play a role because cold storage warehouses are not cheap to build, and cooperatives could help facilitate the construction and financing of of that really critical piece of infrastructure. Well, for for, for the railroad, one of the cold storage stuff, the the cold storage warehouses was that kind of was the rationale along the lines of well, if we have more. Is it- I guess ultimately, was it cheaper to build cold storage and use existing refrigerated cars? Was that what, was that what they were trying to get around? Was from having not having to purchase or buy more of those refrigerated cars? Or okay, exactly, because okay. refrigerated cars um, had pretty limited use. You know, they would use them for for transporting potatoes as well and some other crops. But it's it's a pretty specialized piece of equipment um, that's going to have limited use, and so the railroads didn't want to over purchase for a crop that is transported only a few months out of the year. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, right, well, that's business. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so let's truck along here. So, um, so, so we've been really talking about the teens and kind of the twenties here. Um, but, but what, what was the, the Apple, I guess, industry like, uh, during the depression and world war two? Um, you know, that, that those were two times that had a lot of ups and downs for all parts of American society. So can you kind of talk about how that that era affected the Apple industry there in Washington? Sure. Um, the Depression was quite difficult. Uh, there was about a 34 percent reduction in Apple acreage during the Depression. Now, part of that was people who were trying to grow orchards on lands that were fairly marginal and probably shouldn't have been planted in the first place. So those are kind of the first farms that go out of business. Um, but, it, you know, not only not only do growers have the issue that Americans don't have money to spend on on a Washington apple, which is more expensive and is essentially a luxury good in some ways. Growers themselves, due to bank failures, don't have access to the capital that they need to get the loans to purchase their supplies at the beginning of the season. So those two problems kind of doubly compounded um, with the fact that Congress passed uh, high tariffs, which then led to reciprocal tariffs and kind of killed the export market as well. Um, So there were some creative ideas. Um, Joseph Sicker, who worked for the New York Apple Week Committee, came up with the idea in 1930 of letting homeless individuals sell apples on the streets of New York. And the New York PD agreed to waive the requisite vendor fees. And they had to trust people with that first box of apples because they didn't have money to purchase them outright. Um, but it turns out that that was very successful. An estimated five to 6,000 people a day showed up to get apple boxes. Um, they sold thousands of boxes of apples during that promotion. But that, that wasn't going to save the industry. Um, like I said, the larger problem was capital. Herbert Hoover uh, signed the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in, in February 1932, and that was an attempt to solve the problem. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation provided some federal funds to start agri- agricultural credit corporations, which would then lend money to growers. The problem was these agricultural credit corporations had to be backed with a certain percentage of private funds. And the only place there was no, there was really no way that growers had those funds, and so they went, they went back to the railroads, and the railroads ended up backing these agricultural credit corporations, so that growers could get the loans that they needed to maintain their orchards and keep the industry going. Um, that situation got a little bit better with FDR, and and some of his New Deal programs that that made financing easier, but that really remained a problem throughout the depression and um, those agricultural credit corporations started under the hoover administration weren't closed out until 1941 and the railroads basically had to eat all that money they they didn't recover any of it um kind of led to a souring of the relationship between the railroad corporations and the industry um world war ii of course is a little different situation that you know people people have funds but because of the war, transportation was a little bit more limited. The military requisitioned about 20% of the apple crop. And fresh apples were seen as something that would help boost the troops' morale. 
kind of like Coca-Cola. You know, you get a fresh American apple and a Coca-Cola and make you feel like you're, you're at home. But because of those military requisitions, all of the best apples were being shipped overseas to the military. And what consumers were left with were the Red Delicious apples. The military didn't want to requisition those because they're difficult to store. And we all know what happens to Red Delicious apples. They get warm. They get mushy. Um, Transportation delays, lack of rail cars. And so what consumers were getting in the stores was was really suboptimal. And it hurt the industry tremendously. They had to invest a lot of money, have a big PR campaign after the war to try to to try to fix that reputation. Um, and I should also mention that one of the things we've been talking about marketing, one of the things that finally came to fruition during the depression was the creation of the Washington State Apple Commission in 1937, which was uh, a statewide advertising and marketing research agency. And this was something that the people some people in the industry have been calling for for a long time was coordinated statewide marketing and the depression finally finally forces that hand and we finally get that um so into the last chapter here so so the the, the bulk of your store really seems to cover kind of that turn of the century kind of the creation of the, of the, the apple industry there in washington but the last chapter you kind of take it forward almost the present day so so what is the future of the you know or maybe what is the present and the future look like for the apple industry there in washington This is, I think, something that all agriculture is dealing with right now, but climate change. Um, How how are we going to address the issues of climate change? A lot of the things that growers had to deal with 100 years ago are are still issues. You know, how do you control pests? How do you uh, manage the climate? Uh, In recent years, our snowpack hasn't been what it is. We've been drier. Um, Growers used to have to worry a lot more about keeping orchards warm. And now the conversation has turned to how do we keep the trees cool enough? Um, Two years ago, we had a a big heat wave that hit in June. We had several days over 110 degrees. You know, that's not the kind of climate that apple trees thrive in. So that is kind of the big question moving forward um, that researchers are are looking at and, and trying to address. Uh, the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center, also an outgrowth of the Depression, it, it was founded in 1937 and it's still active and still going. Um, it's an arm of Washington State University. They they have been researching a lot of these issues and dealing with a lot of these issues. And one of the more recent things that, that they've introduced is the Cosmic Crisp variety, um, which was developed speci- specifically for our climate here. So they're looking at things like um, more disease-resistant varieties, more drought-resistant varieties, heat-tolerant varieties. Um, How how can we adapt to the changing environment and still produce food? And that's that's kind of the big question. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a big one. (laughs) It is a big one. You know, it's for me, I kind of think in terms of uh, flathead cherries, up in the Flathead Valley, you know, there were probably these microclimates, and then, and then when that starts to get out of whack, you know, what happens to that very, um, I don't know if, it's, if you call it a niche crop, but it requires a very specific type of environment for that to even be possible. Um, so it's kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm curious about to watch going forward. Um, yeah. Um, so kind of the big one here. Um, so what's uh, how does this book help readers better understand the American West? I think one of the things, like like we were talking about earlier, um, how much the railroads are are really, their fingerprints are all over the West. It's not just the rail lines. It's not just the towns they develop in the real estate. How much they really are invested in industries in the West. And I hope this gives people a, a different window into that because there's this kind of perception that the railroads, you know, the octopus, right? That that they're antagonistic with industry. And certainly if you look at newspapers from central Washington, um, there appears to be an antagonistic relationship. But then when you look at the correspondence, these guys know each other. They're, they go on vacation together. They, they ask about each other's wife and kids. There's a very cordial and cooperative relationship going on behind the scenes that 
that help develop these Western industries. So I think I think that's something that that maybe is a little bit different perspective on how how things worked in the West. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. That that's kind of one of the big takeaways for me. Um, even before I asked you, <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of glad you glad you ended on that one. So, so I always like to end. Well, speaking of ending, I always like to end with this one. So, what's next for you? What, uh, if anything, are you working on right now? Um, I am working on a new project on the U.S. Food Administration in World War One. Um, I was headed by Herbert Hoover, and I just got back from the National Archive Branch in Seattle last week with a whole trove of documents for for how that worked in Washington at the state level. So I'm looking forward to diving into those. Okay. Well, was this an outgrowth of, of this research? Did you kind of see this and, and go, hey, I'm going to chase that down later? Or um, it was something I was, in, <laughs> I was interested in quite a, quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, it, food wasn't rations in World War One. Instead, they kind of focused on distributors and wholesalers and retailers and, and, and individual cooperation. And so um, it's, it's just really fascinating to me how they how they interjected themselves into kind of the the food system, and and how that functioned. Awesome. Okay. Well, well, we'll, we'll call that the end there. Amanda, this was a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.